Hey there, welcome back for another ASMR video. So great to see you again, and I hope that you're doing well. So today we're going to be doing something uh, a little bit different. We're going to be doing another map video. So, um, I don't know if you have ever heard of the place called Zimbabwe. It is a uh, very beautiful land that is in Southern Africa. And um, I happen to know a little bit about it. So I spent um, a little bit, uh, about a year and a half or two uh, living there. And um, I got to really experience uh, the culture and um, meet the amazing people. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the history of Zimbabwe and we're going to look at a map of Zimbabwe and talk about some of the cities there and uh, maybe I can transport you uh, to that place while we're all sort of stuck indoors here. So to begin with, Zimbabwe has been, uh, you know, uh, people have been living there for over a hundred thousand years so if you can just imagine how much history that is it's really amazing to think about so um, it's all started really with the San people and the San people left uh, stone tools cave paintings um, and they really spread their culture there so you can really see the evidence um, you know in caves there and things like that um, and after that, the Bantu people, um, and really a, a mix of different groups of people, um, moved in and out of there. So, um, we can really look at the map and tile this history together, but if you can just envision, um, sort of these San people, and then about the ninth century, um, the Shona people, um, or I believe it might be a proto-Shona, um, group. However, they essentially uh, created it, uh, the towns there, which you can see in the Great Zimbabwe ruins and, um, and some of the stone ruins there. Um, and they sort of ruled that land. Now, there there was some kingdoms that sort of um, were, came in and out of existence throughout that period, um, but it essentially consolidated into that, that Shona tribe. And now at the same time, what was happening down south in South Africa uh, with the King Zulu, the, the Zulu tribe, um, was that King Shaka uh, had a group of um, people who essentially decided to break away and form their own group. So they traveled north, and um, if you are familiar with the geography there, um, you can easily get from South Africa to Zimbabwe, and. Um, that was really their capital down south, Bulawayo, and in that region. And Harare up north was more where the uh, Shona or that's the modern day towns. Um, and then for a period of time, um, that dynamic existed and that of course changed uh, with uh, colonialization. And um, Europeans, uh, uh, Dr. Livingston, as you know, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Um, he discovered uh, Victoria Falls, which are some of the biggest waterfalls in the world. So it was really sort of in modern times um, when the Dutch, the English were in South Africa and uh, Cecil Rhodes came into Zimbabwe and South Africa and he was the governor there. Um, and he has a mixed history, uh, but in terms of how he's perceived, um, but I would put him in the uh, colonialization category. So, um, that was actually the origin of the name, uh, Zimbabwe, which is, was actually formerly known as Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia. Um, and so he sort of, uh, co-opted the culture there. Um, and it's unfortunate in that regard. Um, but it wasn't until actually much later in the 1900s that uh, Zimbabwe had an independence movement and they broke free of British rule. So that was like much of Africa at the time, um, as well as yeah, 
many of the African countries, uh, breaking from France and Germany um, and Portugal, etc. So this is sort of how we end up with the modern Zimbabwe that we know today. There are some other groups that live there. Um, Tswana, the speaking people, um, which are sort of on the western side. Um, you know, with the countries that they border, there is this uh, cultural um, sort of mixing and uh, it's really fantastic. So uh, some of the amazing places in Zimbabwe that are my favorite places are Victoria Falls. Um, we have Harare, we have the Great Zimbabwe Ruins, we have Huangue National Park, which is where uh, Cecil the Lion, as you may know, um, and Mbulawayo, um, Masingo. There's some really amazing places. Um, Victoria Falls is one of my favorite places. So there's so much beauty there. And um, we're going to be not really talking about the um, politics of the situation there. We're really just going to focus on the places and a brief history of each of those places. Um, so I hope that sort of uh, explains it to you. And um, I think we should actually uh, take a look over here, s sit down, really uh, zoom in on this map and um, try to learn more and see, you know, how things ge like, uh, ge geographically speaking came together. Um, so yeah, we're going to do that and yeah, look for it. Let's go to it. Okay. So here we have our map of Zimbabwe. And, uh, as you can see, uh, it's surrounded by Botswana and um, South Africa down in the south. So this is in the southern tip of Africa. And um, it uh, has gone by a couple other names. And um, such as Rhodesia and South Rhodesia and uh, Southern Rhodesia, excuse me. And um, before that, um, you know, it was uh, not exactly formed in this way. So we're going to talk about some of the history of these, um, of this nation and what it looked like in the past. I have this, um, actually it's, I use it a lot as a pointer and, um, it's, uh, from Zimbabwe. Um, so I got it from a solar factory there. And, um, yeah, I just like the design, so I thought it would do like a, so I can get a little closer, it looks sort of like that. So, um, yeah, I'm going to use it today to sort of point out some of these, um, different places here. And, um, yeah, so let's, let's begin. Um, let me just move this map here. So, um, Zimbabwe actually, uh, stems from the term, uh, for Great Zimbabwe, which is a, uh, Shona term, which we'll delve into more. And, uh, the Great Zimbabwe is a, uh, ancient city in the country southeast. And, um, it's, uh, a protected site, but it's, um, a place filled with, um, walls and, uh, built of stone. And they're very ancient. So, um, Zimbabwe was formerly known as uh, Southern Rhodesia, as I mentioned, and then Rhodesia. Now, again, that's during the time of colonialization, so it's sort of, you know, the naming conventions were given, of course, by the British, 
who were the people who came here and um, had control of this region. Um, so Rhodesia is named after Cecil Rhodes, who is a uh, one of the um, explorers, I guess you could call more um, colonialists, who came into South Africa and um, also into Zimbabwe. And he ruled with um, some what some consider to be a level of trickery, um, but that's for another uh, video, perhaps. So we're going to talk about more about the geography here. Um, and um, to begin, we should go way back because. Zimbabwe is a place with a very ancient history. The archaeological record date human settlement of present day Zimbabwe to at least 100,000 years old or ago. Excuse me and the earliest known um, inhabitants of these lands were the San people. And they uh, left behind, as I mentioned earlier, some of the arrowheads and things of that nature, um, and cave paintings, which actually can be found um, all over. Um, but um, it was after that that the Bantu people really emerged, and that was an expansion that existed in more than just uh, this area, but um, that was another um, part of the evolution of this uh, region. So, societies uh, speaking a proto shota language first uh, emerged in the middle of uh, the Limpopo Valley. And um, that was the ninth century. And uh, as you can see, that's down here, um, which is sort of at the border with South Africa. And that was in the ninth century, so they moved into the highlands of Zimbabwe. And um, that kind of became the center of the Shona states. Um, in the 10th century, uh, there were merchants. Uh, so on the, not shown on this map, is uh, the Indian Ocean, and there were merchants from the uh, Arab nations that came and traded. So that's sort of the precursor to the uh, Shona civilization that really took off in the 13th and 15th century. So that's really uh, one of the parts of the ruins at um, Great Zimbabwe, which is uh, over here. Yeah. So there are other sites as well. Um, but for the most part, those are the, uh, the ones that are kind of famous. So this was really the... Uh, Expansion of the kingdom of uh, Mapungubwe, which was the um, first in a series of uh, trading settlements that uh, traded with the Portuguese and really uh, established this region um, into the greater global economy that was a sort of emerging at this time. So they traded uh, gold and ivory and copper for cloth and glass, which was not available here at that time. So from about 1300 to 1600, the kingdom of Zimbabwe further uh, refined and expanded the use of stone architecture, which is, again, 
relating to the stuff we see here um, with the Great Zimbabwe ruins. And um, that's the stuff that really exists to this day. So for till about maybe 1450 to 1760, um, Zimbabwe gave uh, rise to the uh, kingdom of Mutaba. Um, and that's another Shona state which uh, ruled much of the area of present-day Zimbabwe, plus um, central Mozambique, which um, you can see over here, but, you know, it's a very big country as well. And again, um, this state was uh, very known, well-known in strategic trade routes with the Arabs and the Portuguese. And again, Mozambique uh, was a Portuguese colony um, for a long time, and uh, they do speak Portuguese there. So, um, it's uh, kind of an area that they attempted to monopolize in terms of influence. And that uh, really began a series of wars which left the empire in near collapse. So that um, created sort of a power vacuum here. The Shona state really uh, came to fruition. Um, so that lasted till the 1800s and Actually, that's when a uh, Zulu rebellion, which is uh, the Zulu people are in South Africa. And there's a complex history there as well with King Shaka. And uh, you may have seen the movie Shaka Zulu. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, it is uh, they successfully rebelled against British rule um, and they created a state there, and a king um, actually rebelled against him, and uh, they established their own clan, which is the Indibele, and the, um, they fought their way actually northwest into the Transvaal, which is a area of sort of the Dutch, again, the Dutch and the English controlled much of South Africa. And they conquered a lot of the empires down in this area and sort of converged into the southern part here. You can see. Um, and that's in the Bulawayo area. So uh, basically they permanently settled in modern day Zimbabwe. And so um, it's a lot more complicated. hours long talking about the history here and um, I want to focus on the map section here but I would like to just touch briefly on this last um, part so Zimbabwe and in, uh, in later in the 1800s we know the British expanded and Africa was unfortunately the target of a lot of these uh, these expansionist policies for resources and labor, and uh, essentially the kingdom of the Ndebele uh, basically made a, a contract with Cecil Rhodes, perhaps not understanding the full implications of. Uh, these, uh, this contract. So south of here, um, Cecil Rhodes was the governor and um, sort of a corporate um, overlord of South Africa. And um, a lot of it had to do with mining. And um, they moved north in the 1880s. And they... Uh, obtained sort of a concession for mining rights with the king of the Indibele people. And he used this concession to gain support back home in Britain. And 
that was the beginning of the British hold on Zimbabwe. So they essentially came in with um, the military and took certain resources and land. And that is when they adopted the name of Rhodesia. So it had a northern and southern Rhodesia at some point, but um, that's sort of the history leading into uh, the 60s. So um, that led to unrest and, uh, of course, an independence in the renaming to Zimbabwe in the 60s. Now I want to touch on something else here, which is that in 1850s was the first time that there was um, any European here at all. And now you may have heard of David Livingston, um, who is a uh, explorer. And um, he came here and saw, actually, it's up north, but the uh, Victoria Falls, which we'll get to. Um, and uh, he actually... Um, renamed him. They were well known, um, and, uh, you know, to locals and, uh, Dutch explorers, but he named it, uh, in, a, in honor of it, Community Victoria, so we'll talk more about that. So, we're starting off our, um, map exploration with Huangge, which is a, um, National Park here, um, with painted dogs and uh, many elephants, and um, in recent times it's known for the area where the Cecil the Lion incident took place as well, so you can see this here. Now, um, this park was founded in uh, 1928. And, um, essentially, um, it's just a beautiful, um, sort of savannah African, um, landscape. And, um, I spent some time there, and, uh, it is a very, uh, wonderful place. So, next, we're going to Victoria Falls. And, uh, you can see it's on the border with... Zambia and Zimbabwe. Botswana is not far. Namibia is not far as well. And um, it's a set of incredible waterfalls with double rainbows and rainforest surrounding it. Um, it is one of the, in my opinion, the natural wonders of the world. Um, it's, I believe by water volume, it's one of the biggest. It could be the biggest, but I, yeah, maybe Angel Falls. But it's certainly in the top, you know, three, I would say. Um, just depending on which metric you use. But, um, it's, um, has a width of 1,706 meters, or 5,604 feet. So, um, it uh, was founded by, in European terms, um, David Livingston, who was a Scottish missionary and explorer, as I mentioned. And um, he's the first European to have seen it. Um, which was uh, on the 16th of November, 1855. So he paddled out into an island there. And um, he uh, sort of staked his claim at one of the two land masses in the middle of the river. And um, he named it in honor of Queen Victoria. Um, but it had actually had a native name, um, which was the smoke that thunders, 
which is still um, common usage. So, in recent times, uh, it's uh, been known as Victoria Falls, but another one was the Place of the Rainbow, because at uh, a certain time of the day, a rainbow or two rainbows will shine over the falls. So I had recorded it, but uh, it's been a while, so the footage would be a bit grainy, but it's a beautiful sight to see. Um, so it really uh, has a pre-colonial history with stone tools and um, early Iron Age artifacts. So he uh, had been told about the falls, David Livingston sort of before he had reached them, because of course they were a thing of legend in the area. And, um, and he had been impressed with some falls that are a little bit north of here, um, but decided to travel south and found these to be more impressive. So he uh, returned in 1860 to make a detailed study of the area. And... Um, really, uh, it became a place where a lot of European explorers visited, and uh, that's one of the sort of ways that we can uh, think of this place, but there is a legend of a European in the 16th century uh, who's a Portuguese priest named Gonzalo de Silveira. Um, I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation there, but um, there, you know, it could extend further back. But of course, the people who are from here have known about this place since ancient times. Um, so again, you know, I guess it's whatever perspective you're looking at it. But um, that leads us to the next city on the list, and that city is Harare, which is over here. So, Harare, which was formerly known as Salisbury until 1982, is the capital and the largest city in Zimbabwe, with a population of 1,606,000. And in the metro area, 2,800,000. So, um, it's about 1,483 meters above sea level, and uh, it has a subtropical climate. So, it was founded in 1890, and uh, it was founded as a, by really a small military force of the British South Africa Company, which... I mentioned um, with relation to Cecil Rhodes. So, um, essentially, it uh, was the uh, place where it was the country was administered, um, and that really uh, was a traditional role played, um, and sort of in um, international politics there was. Uh, had a position with her, like in that period of time, and um, it was really not until 1982, which is very recent, um, that it was renamed to Harare. So that um, group of soldiers that visited here, um, they founded it as a fort, and um, basically they named it after uh, the third Marquess of Salisbury, who was the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at that time. So, essentially it became uh, a municipality and then a uh, city in 1935. So, in the uh, early days it was poorly drained and uh, they had a lot of work to create a functional city. So, um, they drained it and they created um, the area with a lot of the important government buildings. Um, Salisbury was
was the capital, again, of southern Rhodesia, and essentially they proclaimed uh, independence from the United Kingdom on 19, uh, no, 11th of November 1965, and initially it was called the Republic of Rhodesia in 1970, and that led until 1980, which 18th of April 1980, when the country was renamed to Zimbabwe. So there's a very important role for this area in the independence movement and how this country came to be known as Zimbabwe, which is, I think, important for the uh, origin story. So that's something to think about. Um, and now we're going to move here to Bulawayo. So, Bulawayo is the second largest city, and um, it's in the Madabili land region, which is, you see Madabili land north and south. Um, it has about 650,000 residents, though it is, uh, there are disputes about that. Um, it could be a million, so... Um, it's really uh, an important city, as, like Harare is. Um, it was founded by that king who I mentioned who came north from South Africa, the independent king. And that's really in the um, area where a lot of the trouble began with the British. And um, it was his son, King Lavangula, who succeeded him in the 60s, and then that's uh, who was subsequently captured by the British, uh, the British South Africa Company. So that actually, in the 1800s, led to a war, and um, that war was um, the first Medibili War. So Bulawayo, um, was uh, founded in 1840, and um, it's part of the Matabele land north and south here, you can see, um, and that's where a lot of the trouble originated with the British. So it was the um, independent king, Labangula, who um, ruled Bulawayo until 1893. And he, uh, unfortunately, was the one who signed away the mining rights to the British South Africa Company. And um, they came with force to take this land here. And um, that was the first Matabili War. So, um, essentially, the town, which, again, has British origins, was uh, besieged. And there was another war, the Second Matabili War. And that's when they became a real city in about 1897. So, um, official city status wasn't until the 40s. So, historically speaking, Bulawayo um, has been the industrial uh, heart of Zimbabwe. So, they produce cars and textiles, furniture, food products. And it's the... Uh, hub of the rail network as well. So, um, this is actually, again, where I got this pointer. Um, but they do have a lot of factories and things like that, so that's really interesting. Um, it's, again, a very big city, and so there's a range of just what any big city has, universities, and, um, it's a majority uh, in the Belle city, um, but it is a diverse place regardless. Um, there, there are Ashona people there too, so, um, and again, Harare tends to be more Ashona than in the Belle. so you do see, a, a split there, um, but, um, outside of, um, Bulawayo is a beautiful national park, which was the spiritual home of the, um, people, uh, dating back really even to um, the San, and that's outside of here. So it's a uh, area of wooded valleys, and it 
really, um, they're beautiful stone formations, and, um, they take all sorts of shapes and sizes, and, um, not only that, but it's littered with, um, the cave paintings that I mentioned, and essentially it is a national park, so, um, the remainder of it is a communal land, um, which does extend to farmlands and things of that nature, but, um, for the most part, uh, most part it's really, uh, still a spiritual home there. Um, the San Bushmen lived in those hills, like, thousands of years ago. Um, perhaps more, and there are about 3,000 registered rock art sites. I've seen some of them, and they're very beautiful, and it feels amazing to be in touch with, uh, such an extremely long history. Um, some of the archaeological finds date far as back to the pre-Middle Stone Age, so that's 300,000 BP, um, and, um, I recommend you, uh, going to see some of the caves there. Um, it's, again, just one of the really grand and amazing, um, parts of this country. So the grandeur and stillness of the hills has really contributed to that hollowed reputation, and um, many religious and uh, spiritual rituals are pre um, performed there in the hills, and before the colonial era, it was the headquarters of the spiritualist oracle, the Mulivo. And, um, it's also uh, the scene of a famous um, battle, and um, basically it's where um, Cecil Rhodes made his last stand, and um, that's where he's buried actually to this day. So um, it's a really sacred place, and um, there's some controversy there because, again, he has a mixed um, legacy there, so um, we're not going to delve into that, but that's simply what is there. So, um, next we're going to go to um, Great Zimbabwe, which is over here. So, the Great Zimbabwe is an ancient city in the southeastern hills of Zimbabwe, which is essentially near the town of Masvingo. Um, it was thought to have been the, um, capital of this kingdom, and, uh, it really took form in the 11th century in the late Iron Age. The, uh, abandonment of the city was not too far, um, about the 15th century. So within a couple hundred years, the empire had collapsed or shifted. And, um, essentially the edifices and stone workings were, um, products of the Shona, ancestral Shona here. Um, so the stone city spans an area of about seven square kilometers. And at that time, maybe at its peak, it had about 18,000 people. Uh, Great Zimbabwe is really believed to have been a royal palace for the monarch there, and it would have been used as a uh, seat of political power. The walls were constructed without mortar, and essentially it, uh, well, some of these walls actually are 11 meters high, so, um, they project sort of a political, um, a power, uh, and Without um, the mortar in the city, it did fall into ruin. So the earliest known written mention of Great Zimbabwe ruins was in 1531 by a Portuguese captain on his uh, garrison in Mozambique. The 
first confirmed visits weren't until the 19th century, with the investigations not really beginning until 1870s. They uh, were very controversial at the time, and um, it put political pressure on the um, government of Rhodesia to deny its construction by native people, actually. Um, but essentially, to this day, it is now really heralded as a um, part of the national movement of Zimbabwe, and um, it is a very special place that, just compared to some small ruin, it, it's definitely uh, something to see. And now, essentially, uh, there are about 200 sites along here. Um, and also in Mozambique, but um, Great Zimbabwe is the biggest. So um, Zimbabwe is the name of the Shona name for the ruins. Um, but um, essentially, there's a lot of you know controversy about where that name comes from, um, which might be too complicated for this video today. But um, Upon a further investigation, um, the majority of scholars do believe it was built by members of the Gokomire culture. Again, I might be mispronouncing that, but um, they were ancestors of the modern Shona. So that area was initially settled um, in the 4th century, between the 4th and 7th century. So... Um, communities in the Kokomira and the Ziwa culture. They farm that valley and mined and worked the iron. But um, they didn't build stone structures. So again, the, we're talking about the origins of um, that region being settled. Um, so that was the name of the culture that did that. So, so the construction of the stone building didn't start until the 11th century, and uh, continue for about 300 years. Now these ruins are some of the oldest and largest structures in southern Africa, and um, the second oldest after uh, Mapungubwe in South Africa. So um, again, it's a really fantastic place. So. Um, one last thing I'd like to add there is that um, at its peak, it had about 18,000 uh, inhabitants. Um, however, um, there are discussions that uh, it didn't never existed or exceeded 10,000. So that's definitely something something to think about there. So I'm just going to briefly touch on some of these other places here. But we've got uh, Queru. Inyati, East Nor, Lupani, we've got Plum Tree, Mvuma, Kwe Kwe, Kadoma, Chegutu, Chitunwiza. We've got Rusabe, Mutari, Chimani Mani, Gokwe, Kildonan. Maurondera Got Svish Avani We've got Kwanda We've got Kama TV Chiranzi, 
Ratanga. I think I may have said that. Nandi Mill. We've got Lake Karima, which is sort of cut off here, but it's a beautiful lake. We've got Inyanga. We've got Mutoko. And Chipinje. Most of them, um, Pandora, and, um, you can't see, I don't know if it's, might be cut off, but Light Bridge is another one there on the border with South Africa, Victoria Falls. some of the amazing places in this wonderful country and again there are other things to discuss with regards to Zimbabwe but in terms of the landscape and the geography um, and the culture that is there it is a really lovely place so in conclusion uh, these are some of the amazing places in Zimbabwe and uh, there are other components when talking about Zimbabwe in general, but um, the beautiful landscapes and the wildlife and the people who live there. Um, it is a wonderful culture and place to see. And um, I hope one day you are able to travel there. Um, that said, um, it's been a pleasure to have you, but I hope that you learned a lot and that you have a really great 